You are without doubt the worst pirate I've ever heard of. But you have heard of me. back half glass gaming you know me your homie you show me love it's a wrap for you <laughs> i'm joined as always by uh mix master josh you not mix master mandy the alliteration there no nope, i didn't want to go that way all right <laughs> well you can just call me josh beatbox and mandy and the radical rev well, that would be me see i got the alliteration mm-hmm. i was gonna say rhyme master rev <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> I feel like I'm better at thinking about this this morning. Yeah, maybe you guys should just call me just Julian. <laughs> yeah, it's almost as if um, I'm looking in a mirror, which is weird to me when I look at you, Josh. And I see how you've grown into me. A thin, black vegetarian. Mm-hmm. It's like a weird dream. Kafkaesque, almost. Yes, very much so. Speaking of weird dreams, anybody got any? I, I have a dream where I wake up and my house is clean and I'm in a steady, well-paying job that I enjoy. That's that's quite a dream, I think. Mm-hmm. I had a dream once where I was uh, riding my bike through the yard of the local grouchy old man in my neighborhood. <laughs> and uh, we inadvertently collided. And when I woke up, I was the old man. And I was no longer Corey Feldman. <laughs> I think that was actually a movie. That's debatable. We'll table that. I, I had a dream once that I was working, and uh, for some reason my job was just to like sweep the floors. And we had a, a new employee coming in, and I was training her, and she kept talking about seagulls, but she kept calling them pterodactyls. <laughs> And I, I felt like I was, you know, going rolling with it for a while. I was like, all right, all right, you know, I know what she's saying. And then it started bothering me, and it was like bothering me more and more. And finally, I was just like, you know what? They're actually called seagulls. The pterodactyl is a dinosaur. <laughs> and then one of my other coworkers walked in just at that moment and was like, really? I've always called them pterodactyls. <laughs> <laughs> also, pterodactyls are not dinosaurs. Mm. To be fair, though, they do sound the same. They're not dinosaurs. Pterodactyls are pterosaurs. Are they are different because they are just a different species of creature. They're just not the same thing as dinosaurs were. Mm. I think the the verdict is still out on that one. <laughs> but I mean, now that they're naming dinosaurs after Harry Potter characters, it's getting a little ridiculous. Yeah, anyway. it's, a, it's a free for all now. <laughs> what is it, Dumbledoreosaurus? <laughs> Dumbledoreus. But anyways. What about you, Mandy? No, well, I just, I've been dreaming about whatever video games I've been playing lately. Mm-hmm. So, mostly right now, I'm just dreaming that I'm solving puzzles in The Witness. I, I mean, think that's actually been really common with The Witness. I've been seeing people, like, tweet about that and stuff, where they're, like, you know, driving on the road, and I'm, like, solving puzzles in the, in the lines of the road, and like, all this <laughs> stuff. Once you get into a rhythm with that game, then it's just really easy to picture up a puzzle in your head and then figure out how to solve it. And I mean, like, I make up puzzles out of nowhere in my head, and they somehow are solvable. <laughs> so I'm not really sure what that game is doing to my brain, but it's probably good for me. Sounds like your own version of The Matrix. <laughs> All the conversation about The Witness has been really weird, because it's half, like, people really having fun with the puzzles of the game, mm-hmm. and half people being really mad at Jonathan Blow, because he made one tweet about his king getting pirated. Mm-hmm. This guy's tweeting about piracy, huh? No, he made... One tweet where he said, hey, like, my game's getting pirated a lot. It's cool. Lots of people are liking it, but, you know, we won't have money to make another comparable game in the future unless people buy it. And then all these sites obviously picked up, like, and it's more a name than I'm even making it sound. Mm -hmm. But uh, all these sites picked it up and, like, the witness piracy, blah, 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 and, like, turned into news stories. Then a lot of people dislike Jonathan Blow. Well, I don't get I mean, that's a fair statement to make, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, and so and a lot of people dislike anyone who says anything negative about piracy. So people have just been piling on, like enraged, and well, they're like, "What a baby!" Yeah. He needs to like, like, never mind that he spent like eight million dollars of his own money to yeah. make that game. It is 
now massively in debt. Like, yeah, how dare he tweet about piracy? I mean, I can sort of get why there's an instinctive backlash. Not because piracy isn't kind of a shitty thing to do, but because there's a lot of politicians, sitting politicians who are supposed to know better, uh, who like will use piracy as a reason to institute really dumbass laws uh, that allow all sorts of bullshit uh, on the internet. Mm -hmm. But even with that, there's there's no excuse for the kind of rage that happens on the internet when people are like, hey, could you could you maybe pay for the thing that I am selling mm -hmm. and not giving away for free? Well, Piracy is like baked into internet culture though, and it's it's really frustrating because I used to I used to be in a band and with like tour and stuff and I would like shop at the shows and people would be like, Oh yeah, my friend burnt your CD for me and I really liked it and it's like, Okay, that's that's a compliment, I'm glad you like my music, but at the same time, like if you actually paid for my CD, I could afford to make more music, which is what I want to be doing and, you know, not having to work my job all the time. And so it was this weird, frustrating thing, but they would like say it to my face as if it's like not a thing that I would even have any right to be upset over. Mm -hmm. And it was, it always put me in like such a weird position because yeah. like, the second I say anything, I'm the bad guy. But at the same time, like these people don't even realize that they're hurting people with mm -hmm. what, they're doing, what they're doing. Well, once I realized that uh, movie piracy hurt Ben Affleck, <laughs> um, that really changed my perspective. And you started pirating every movie. I started pirating the shit out of pirated movies. <laughs> 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 going real dark on that one <laughs> but uh so i think this would be a good time for me to call a break um shiver our timbers um i'd like to of course thank uh 2xaa and wheelie for the music which we didn't pirate uh of course you can uh, find us on uh retroball.com halfblastgaming.com you'll find a detailed list of all the games that we discuss in every episode of course we're also on itunes Stitcher. Um, so we're going to raise the skull and crossbone flag when we get back. It's called the Jolly Rogers. And start talking about piracy. Shiver me timbers. I'm in Davy Jones' locker. We'll be right back. Thanks for the uh, sticking around after the break. Um, piracy, man. But the, yeah, no, I think uh, Josh was on to something with uh, piracy kind of embedded into internet culture. And like, I have a lot of friends that do comedy music. And I see this interesting kind of thing going on where a lot of them are okay with some piracy because they understand that like they're small time musicians, mm -hmm. even the ones that are trying to make a living off of their music, they are playing in a really niche genre. Like if people don't have free, easy access to their music, they're just not going to get known. But at the same time, like, there is absolutely this tipping point where, okay, now more people are, are, are pirating my music than actually paying me money for it. And if these people who say that they like my music and who say that they want to support my music would actually pay me money for the thing I'm trying to sell, then I could keep making it. Mm -hmm. The music industry is so corrupt and is so filled with, you know, opportunistic corporations that come in and exploit people. And that's how it's been for, you know, 50 years. Uh, and so people, when the internet came in, it was like, oh, great, you know, we can finally overthrow this corrupt system. Mm -hmm. the, these underground bands can co come up from the underground. You know, we can have the death of a major label. We can have a better music industry all, all around. Unfortunately, what happened is that piracy stretched out from there to these bands that are, you know, a five-person band that makes $90 for playing a show and has to sell t-shirts and CDs just to break even on gas. And then people are stealing their stuff and then they have to break up or stop touring or stop making music. Like, ironically, in the, in the, in the early days, it helped, you know, wrestle the industry away from the, the corporate giants. But it ended up hurting everyone else, too, mm -hmm. in the long run. Well, I think with the um, ease of access that comes with the um, Internet, 
a culture has kind of sprung up that doesn't even necessarily view it as piracy, but it's just, you know, the way things go. As far as, like, games are concerned, pre-internet. Well, I mean, there is a lot of game copying. Even before you could buy games for the PC mm-hmm. on a floppy disk, a lot of games were actually released on cassette tapes, which were incredibly easy to copy. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, so you just put a couple pieces of tape over the tab and... Uh... <laughs> I mean, there's a version of the Commodore 64 that played cassette tapes, Mm -hmm. and there were also systems that would use VHS tapes, and it was just because it was an easy, comparatively cheap format, and they weren't really thinking about piracy at all, because gaming was still in its infancy. I had a friend that had Frogger on a cassette tape. Yeah, I was a kid. I was probably in third grade, and I was like, what are you doing? Like, how does that work? And he put his cassette tape in, and we played Frogger. That's crazy. My grandfather had a computer that used cassette tapes and mm. I remember playing a lot of uh, one of the Where in the World is Carmen San Diego games on the cassette tape. So it goes from cassettes, uh, VHS mm, then to floppy disks right. and when the Amiga was released it actually came with a tutorial on how to copy games Oh wow! and they weren't thinking about piracy in the slightest. They were thinking wow it'll be really great if everybody knows how to back up their games and then won't lose them so they're like they printed detailed instructions on how to copy their games and then it really screwed them over because people thought oh we can just copy and share everything Mm -hmm. and so the Amiga wasn't selling software because one person would buy a game and give it to all of their friends or would make like discs with a bunch of Amiga games on them Mm -hmm. and then people would just get that and copy it over and over instead of buying anything and most game consoles even then were making money on software rather than hardware sales and you're losing money off hardware sales so people buying a system to play pirated games is just devastating for them. Oh, yeah. And then it starts to find its way into console games. What happened with console gaming is a lot of countries developed clone consoles. Mm-hmm. Famiclones. Yes. Famiclones is that you're like so widespread that the name Famiclone it was commonly used. But these were primarily countries where you couldn't even get these consoles legally. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably the most successful was the Russian console, the Dendi, the Dendi. which was <laughs> so popular that it had like TV commercials and animations and stuff really? around it. It looked a lot like a NES, mm-hmm. a little brighter and more colorful, and it could play pirated NES cartridges. These are people legally buying games right. at a store within laws of Russia or China or the country. So the games are available to buy, but the consoles themselves aren't. Well, the games they're buying are also pirated. Okay. What people would do is they would copy the data from the game mm-hmm. and then basically make their own cartridge to run it and sell it at a profit to themselves because they weren't ordering all these copies of the game from the supplier. They were copying the data from one and then manufacturing the cartridges themselves mm-hmm. so they were able to turn a much larger profit. And those things are like still fairly prevalent, uh, the, the clone consoles. Uh, if you just search on YouTube, a lot of very popular uh, video game YouTubers will have a couple of videos about, you know, playing these clone consoles or playing these pirated, uh, hacked games. Mm-hmm. Well, and who doesn't have fond memories of playing these super... Marion Brothers, <laughs> right? Obviously, Tetroid. Tetroid, great as well. Definitely, you know when you or when I used to go to some of the file sharing sites like Kazaa or whatever, mm-hmm. and download an emulator and just like 772 ROMs or whatever. Like a lot of them were these weird, bizarre, bizarrely named games, and some of those were ROM hacks, mm-hmm. but some of those were just uh, ROMs of pirated games. Mm-hmm. Well, so now. The dandy, things of this nature. Is that something that you would see pop up in territories where you could get these consoles? No, uh, the dandy was primarily sold in the USSR, Mm -hmm. which the uh, NES was never officially released there. And it sold over 2 million copies. So, yeah, and you'll see a lot of clone consoles in China where consoles were illegal for a large period of time. So the only way to get it was on the gray market. And so buying these clone consoles wasn't necessarily, it wasn't legal, but it wasn't illegal either. Mm It's sort of decriminalized in that they're like, oh, you shouldn't have those, but you're not facing Mm -hmm. uh, legal repercussions except maybe a fine. So then this, of course, leads to 
piracy prevention, I would imagine. Yeah, and yeah. even the a lot of... saying, hey, cut the crap, Dendy. Stiefler. <laughs> <laughs> the Stiefler Dendy, yes. <laughs> but uh, no, I'll, I'll, even a lot of those old NES cartridges had at least some form of piracy protection. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it was really simple. Just, you know, it, it would see it run a check to see if you're running a legit version of the game, and if it wasn't, it wouldn't let you play the game or something like that. But then some of them were pretty creative, like Bucky O'Hare. On the NES, uh, if you play, if it saw you're playing the pirated version, you would just die if you got hit even <laughs> once, and yeah. all the enemies were more prevalent and more powerful, so it just turned it into this almost impossibly hard game. Mm-hmm. So I imagine a lot of people went out and bought a game like Bucky O'Hare, and they're like, ah, this is a terrible game, yeah. <laughs> and never even realized. Now that's for pirated games on proprietary consoles, is that what happened? I mean, if you bought a Dendi and then you bought, you know, a pirated version of Bucky O'Hare, mm-hmm. they build it into the I cartridge see. design and usually run multiple checks. And so if the game failed, this check mm-hmm. this would happen. And sometimes, you know, they do a good, a good enough job that they can pass some of these checks. But a lot of the games with a really complex piracy mm-hmm. protection would have a lot of layers of checks. Mm-hmm. And so there'd be something weird that would eventually pop up. If you played far enough into the game. Mm -hmm. Curious. And, you know, a lot of these companies were just trying to scam people and make a profit, or at least scam companies and make a profit, so they weren't necessarily working really hard to get around the piracy prevention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Earthbound have a really interesting... Yeah, Earthbound had some of the most brutal piracy prevention ever implemented, uh, and that Earthbound was released for the Super Nintendo and Super Famicom, but uh, Earthbound turned up the random encounter rate, so it was just insanely impossibly high, so it would be just brutal to to try and get through this game. And if you manage to make it all the way through the game, this insane, impossible game, and got to the end uh, with the final boss, the game would freeze and you'd have to reset and your entire save file would be deleted. Oh, that's brutal. They, they, they intended to ruin your yeah. life for yeah. pirating this game. Captain Jack Sparrow, what are you doing to me? <laughs> <laughs> But uh, on the PC, what a lot of games did is they had manual checks where Mm -hmm. they'd ask you to check something on the manual or there'd be puzzles that you could only solve if you checked the manual or something that came in the box. And that was a nightmare because, especially if you were a kid, you were just going to lose manuals all the time. And then they'd say, you know, what's the seventh word on page 14 in the manual? And you'd have no idea what your manual was. Or they'd have like a color wheel. I remember having getting some games... Uh, in many of these games I got legitimately, they were just used, mm-hmm. uh, and like you needed a color wheel, like, you know, split, slide the wheel to this thing and type in the color, like, I don't have the color wheel, I can't do this. Mm. When it got, when you were downloading games on the internet, people just scan the manuals anyways or take pictures of them or say, for this puzzle, put in right. this word. So it wasn't even very good piracy protection. It was just a big headache yeah, big for the people the who had the game. Le- legitimate gamers. I mean, I guess it's say. good to remind you to keep track of where your manuals are. Because mm-hmm. I was probably a lot better at that once I realized that was going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. But And what does something like the Game Shark come in on the scale? Piracy. I mean, they're altering code. It's sort of frowned upon. They weren't released by Nintendo, let's say. Personally, I've never been bothered by Game Sharks or similar devices unless people are using them for games with online play, like mm-hmm. Pokemon and, you know, trying to trade hacked Pokemon to people. But I actually really like data mining and messing around in code and seeing what's in there. Mm-hmm. That stuff is fascinating to me because there are a lot of things you can't see. Um, I used to run a program where I could take my uh, PS1 discs and just it would search for all data so I could get like little files, I could get all the videos, and then I could just read through code and look for interest. <laughs> and I'm a boring enough person that reading through game code is super fun for me. I don't know, yeah. I don't really know programming languages, but I know enough. Mm-hmm. I used to do that with my PC games as a kid too, just mess around in the code and see what I could find and hack my games mm-hmm. <laughs> by altering the code and uh-huh. seeing what it would do to the game. Did you spend a lot of time with the hacking features of the Matrix game? I, I did not. Okay. I, I used to hack a, a Howie Mandel game that was like <laughs> Howie Mandel's big <laughs> word adventure. <laughs> and like it had like a thing where you could pick your name and make it call you like Barfhead or Pineapple Princess. <laughs> and so I would like make it call other people Barfhead or mm-hmm. like it would sing you a song if you got an answer right about you being smart it was mm-hmm. an edutainment game and so I would like 
like make it so every answer was the right answer or all the yeah. answers were wrong and so you'd like say like something in the constitution was boogers and then it was singing a song about being smart <laughs> it was a really easy game to mess yeah. with so i spent a lot of time hacking <laughs> the great word adventure i think is the name of that game howie mandel's the great word adventure wow i bet the sandys are going apeshit <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I, I I bought that game. Howie Mandel made money off of it, and mm-hmm. I don't think he or the publisher would particularly care that I thought it was more fun to mess around with the game's code. Mm-hmm. I'm sure Bobby like... would approve. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like something Bobby's world yeah. I would definitely get behind. I, I, right I on his little big wheel <laughs> through, through lines of code. That's yeah. that would happen on Bobby's world, don't you know? Yeah, that sounds like something from a Bobby's world version of a shining. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's true. In that case, you know, even if you're not enjoying the game as the developer intended, Mm -hmm. companies are still profiting off the game, so nobody is being harmed. I think game sharks are really only an issue when they're harming the online components of a game. And Pokemon game sharks and similar devices are a nightmare. Mm -hmm. You can use, or at least I recall, having a... Game Shark like device for my PS1. Yeah. Uh, that you could use it to play pirated games. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, you know, it required starting off with a, a proper game and then switching the discs out. So there's the spring to keep the lid open. Yeah, and, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so in that aspect, you know, you could use it to play pirated games. That was, we use that to play, um, non like region games or like Japanese imports. Right. So. And and that was where uh the person who showed it to me found out about it mm-hmm. because he could speak Japanese and he liked importing games. Uh he he played uh Final Fantasy IX, he got that imported, played it before it came out in the US. Mm-hmm. Uh and he's like, Yeah, and as a side effect you can do this. And so, you know, that's that's how I learned mm-hmm. that's actually how I learned about pirated games. <laughs> Now, this seems like it gets out of hand, I imagine, at some point. Piracy. Oh, absolutely. um, Much to the detriment, possibly, of consoles themselves. Yeah, and as as I mentioned before, the Amigo is really killed by piracy because they needed software sales Mm -hmm. to make the console profitable. So They just made it walk the plank. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, the Dreamcast, and there are a lot of things that contributed to the failure of the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast contributed to the failure of the Dreamcast. Well, the Dreamcast is probably my favorite video game console. Yeah. Well, the dream, time, the Dreamcast was a great console. No, that was solid. I like those little, what were those little things you could play, like little mini game boys. Yeah, they had a memory cards that you plugged into your controller with a separate little tiny screen. You could have separate games mm-hmm. on that. No, I mean the Dreamcast was an amazing. It was ahead of its time. That there sounds were a like lot the of NX. I don't know because there's so much misinformation about the NX, mm-hmm. but uh, the Dreamcast, it was incredibly easy to pirate on the Dreamcast. All you needed was a disc swap, mm-hmm. and then you could swap out and play burned versions of any game. A disc swabber? A disc swap? No, a disc swabber. Like a deck swabber? <laughs> I said swabber! <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so it's a bad pirate pun. Yeah. So piracy for the Dreamcast was a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, when the Dreamcast already was having so many issues that just game piracy being prevalent on top of that was really another nail in the coffin. Mm-hmm. I don't think you could blame piracy for the death of the Dreamcast, but it certainly contributed or even sped it up. Mm-hmm. Sony is on record as saying that piracy is what killed the PSP. Really? Yeah, and I mean. I think that's probably valid. It was incredibly easy to pirate games on the PSP from the very beginning. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like a lot of the time when companies say piracy is what caused this problem, like, there's always something that goes, but what about? Because, like, so, you know, you already said the Dreamcast, you can't only fault piracy. With the PSP, sure, Sony says that piracy probably killed it, but what about the fact that it had this really bizarre UMD format that nobody wanted to wanted to mess with? It was annoying, and it actually made the discs uh, more fragile, and so nobody wanted to buy this thing. 
Was it easy to pirate? Oh, it, was incre- oh, it was incredibly easy to pirate anything. If you got an original version of the PSP, you could just pirate everything right from the go. They updated that with firmware later on, and people mm-hmm. would come out with cracks for the firmware. And eventually, people figured out how to run Flash firmware, which meant you could just basically trick it into running a different version of firmware that would completely allow for piracy. Wow. So from the very beginning, you could pretty much pirate anything you want and you could emulate games too mm-hmm. which was actually really cool the PSP was a great handheld emulator but even buying it to use as a handheld emulator and not buying games was harmful to Sony and the PSP despite how its software did sold over 80 million copies I bought two <laughs> <laughs> clearly there was a large subset of people who were buying the handheld and not buying the games mm-hmm. so Sony can see that I can see absolutely what they drive draw that conclusion. Mm-hmm. So this brings us to the mother of all piracy breeding grounds, the PC. Right. And I mean, almost everything, at least until the last year or so on the PC, was cracked almost immediately, mm-hmm. put on torrent sites everywhere, mm-hmm. and people can instantly download almost any game they want. There have been a lot of developers who refuse to do PC exclusives anymore. Mm-hmm. I mean, and you look at that, almost every game that used to be PC exclusive, you can get on consoles now, which is great for me as someone who doesn't really enjoy yeah. gaming on my PC. I'm kind of shocked when I'm looking at a game that sounds interesting and I see that it's PC only these days. I mean, it it's super rare. It's mm-hmm. it's not at all rare for a game to be PC only mm-hmm. for a limited period of time. But almost everything comes to console now. And there have been a lot of developers, even major developers, who have said, you know, everything is pirated so heavily and it just doesn't make sense to make games exclusively for PC anymore. It's a bad financial decision for them. Mm-hmm. When I was playing a lot of PC games, I was buying most of my games legally. But the first thing I would do is go to a crack site and crack my games mm-hmm. because I didn't want to have to be swapping my discs all the time. Uh, that that that's a problem. Like that's a form of DRM that just didn't work, mm-hmm. and it made it was punishing legal owners of the games. Mm-hmm. And I think that helped justify a lot of the piracy, mm-hmm. where it's like, well, if you're gonna give us this DRM version of this game, we're gonna crack it and get a better version. Uh, Gabe Newell has has talked about this and has has talked about how if the pirated version of a piece of software is more valuable than the legal version, then people have incentive to pirate. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's why he believes strongly in letting Steam, you know, it's like if you have a computer and you're logged into your Steam account, you can just download your game and play it. Mm-hmm. Do, do people share Steam accounts and, and share games across three, four, five, six computers? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's legal Steam sharing built in too, just like there is on the Sony consoles and presumably mm-hmm. Xbox consoles. Yeah, I'm not sure how that works, but I heard there was some basically yeah you could share. You have a limited amount and you can't play the game mm-hmm. while they're playing it, which is which is really smart and totally reasonable. Uh, I know Josh and I sometimes do share games between our consoles, and it's set up that way. And Sony designed the program, and it's just I can't play it while he's playing it, so it's the exact same thing as if I lent him my disc. Mm-hmm. But I mean, at the same time, it de- it de incentivizes piracy. You know, DRM really became not necessarily popular, but um, prevalent. I guess you could say in the eyes of the everyday Joe gamer. There are very few effective forms of DRM that isn't going to inconvenience somebody who bought it. That's not true anymore because of Denuvo. Yeah, well, this is something I haven't heard of. Please tell me. Uh, Denuvo is right now the top tier form of. Uh, video game DRM. It's minimally invasive. What it what it does is that it keeps you from altering the EXE file in any way. And a lot of games are still built that they can be modded even though you can't uh, alter the EXE file. For example, Just Cause 3, which still hasn't been cracked mm-hmm. and will almost certainly, it seems like at this point, never be cracked, at least not until years down the line. You know, people put in a multiplayer mod where they invented their own multiplayer and they can still do that. Mm-hmm. It's just that the EXE file can't be modified and that's the only thing you can't do. Mm-hmm. There is only one piracy group that was even trying to crack Dunubo because it was so difficult and recently they said that they were taking a year off from trying to crack a game so they could see how it impacted sales. 
<laughs> which is really pretty clearly that they just they can't do it anymore. No game with De Nuvo has actually been cracked. Mm. The closest thing people have done is create an emulator where you can sort of play the pirated versions of these games with a lot of bugs, mm-hmm. and a lot of them haven't even been cracked to that extent. Going back to what I said in the, about the music industry is like people were fine stealing from the music industry because the music industry was ripping off consumers and it was also ripping off the bands that were making the music mm-hmm. and things like that. The, the music industry was ripping everyone off. And mm-hmm. so people were like, you know, screw you, we win. And it felt justified. It felt like, like, oh yeah, I'm part of this cause. I'm right. doing good. Same with the, the movie industry and pirating movies. Mm-hmm. Except, you know, Metallica really fought back. Well, and that's, that's the other thing. Like, you, like, I feel like there's a lot of, uh, in trying to make piracy seem wrong, there's a lot of dumb misinformation and, you know, like the, the infamous movie, you wouldn't download a car. No, I thought you would download a car. <laughs> if you gave me the opportunity to download a car, I would download five and sell four of them. The same thing happened with DRM when big companies like EA were pushing really hard mm-hmm. to DRM everything mm-hmm. and to, to be very invasive with what they were doing. And, you know, companies like Capcom, we're pushing so hard to make their games less enjoyable and less playable to the people who are actually paying for them mm-hmm. that it gave those pirates that the people who were pirating it, pirating it felt absolutely justified. It's like, well, if you're going to fucking break my game, I'm going to get a version from a, from a hacker mm-hmm. who has a superior version of your product. Yeah, But I feel like when companies go out of their way to make it as beneficial and non-invasive as possible, people are still like, no, fuck that. And Steam is a really good example. Yes, you have to have a Steam account to play your game. You don't have to be connected to the internet. And Steam keeps an archive of all your games so that if you have a Steam account on any computer, you can download the game. There are games that I have now that I bought for $5 that I never would have looked at before. And because of that, I feel that it's also giving lie to another very popular justification for piracy, which is, oh, well, you know, people wouldn't try these things otherwise. Well, okay, that that's sometimes true. Like, uh, you know, I'm not going to say I've never pirated a game. Uh, I The first Portal game, what happened was a friend of mine fixed my computer and they just put it on there for me. I'm like, oh, well, I have Portal now. Okay. Uh, but to this day, I haven't bought Portal because I puzzle games aren't my thing. Portal 2 was on sale uh, on Steam for like two bucks during a, uh, some Christmas sale or another. And I bought it for two dollars because I went, if I play it for 15 minutes and go, not my thing, I'm out two dollars. Mm-hmm. So when people are like, oh, well, you know, piracy lets people try these games that they wouldn't try otherwise, or, you know, they wouldn't have bought these games for normal price. Yeah, but sometimes you would. Well, I think also we live in a country where, I mean, there's a good portion of people that do not have access to the Internet. The infrastructure sucks. But this leads us to outside of the United States, the legality of piracy in other countries. I mean... Poland seems to be on that list. Piracy was legal Mm -hmm. in Poland for a fairly large period of time. It was completely legal to sell pirated versions of games, like commercially, in a store. Oh my gosh, yeah. CD Projekt Red actually started out selling pirated games. Mm -hmm. And then they, when Baldur's Gate came out, it was five discs, and they realized it could be financially viable for them to sell this game legitimately because five discs is a lot for people who are selling pirated games and it was a really high quality game and so they used the money they had got from selling pirated games to legitimately get the license to sell a Polish version of Baldur's Gate and sell that and that was really successful and then they eventually went into game development and of course they also own GOG where they sell DRM for mm-hmm. games and mm-hmm. they've been known to help pirates even on torrent sites. I think they're really sympathetic to the position because they started out that way themselves mm-hmm. but I mean it's really different in a country where piracy is legal and the norm and that's what happens when we go to a GameStop we're not buying pirated games but in a lot of other countries without our kind of copyright law you're going into a store and almost all the games are pirated Mm -hmm. and that's just completely different from when you can 
I mean, you can easily and legally buy any game and even have a lot of free options. In a lot of countries, you can't even le- legally use a credit card to pay for games online. Yeah. Like in Iran, for example. Right. The only, the only games that have successfully been able to do any sort of free-to-play mechanics are games that have point cards that they can sell in stores and people can buy their point cards there because they can't type in their card and play a free-to-play game. Mm-hmm. So that's not a viable option. Mm-hmm. Uh, most games never get legitimate releases there. Most game stores overwhelmingly sell pirated games. Is it, you know, like you got one guy pirating all these games and then like disseminating them? Or are we talking about just anybody can do it? And it's the same game, would you have multiple different pirated versions of it? You mean in terms of companies that are selling these pirated yeah, games in stores? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there are some companies, particularly in China, where they crack all their games themselves. And mm-hmm. so they'd get one copy and crack it and set it up and get the packaging and get it in. Because people are buying physical copies of these pirated games. People aren't even downloading them because a lot of these people don't have internet access or they have bandwidth caps. Mm-hmm. And so they're getting a game that might be reasonably old even to us at this point and maybe translating it or maybe selling it in English and cracking the game and packaging it and selling it themselves. And then there are plenty of other places where you can buy some game that was downloaded from the internet and cracked by some random group and has all sorts of weird text added in. And you could buy that on cart or on disc. Mm -hmm. What I think is really interesting is the legality behind translation patches in foreign games, especially because many of the games that are translated uh, come out of Japan, which is one of the only countries where piracy is a criminal offense Mm -hmm. that you can go to prison for. Really? I think two years is the maximum sentence for downloading something and 10 years is the maximum sentence for distributing something Mm. yourself so if anybody even wants to do this they have to buy the game legitimately in japan leave the country to it and go back to another country where piracy is legal and then sell it that way there is a game called Garage, Bad Door Adventure, and they're only, I'm sorry, Bad Dream Adventure, not Bad Door Adventure. <laughs> Bad Door Adventure is a much cooler title. <laughs> but uh, there were only 3,000 copies of the game ever mm-hmm. released in Japan. It was incredibly rare and really interesting, and nobody could play it. Nobody could buy it anywhere. In 2014, someone in Australia finally wound up paying about $700 to get a legitimate copy of the game and import it to Australia. Mm-hmm. And then they dumped it and shared it on the internet. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a thing that nobody can legitimately experience, even most people in Japan. So translation patches or piracy are literally the only way to even preserve that art. Especially if a company goes under and nobody has a license and the game just sort of disappears. There Mm -hmm. are very few legitimate copies even in circulation. Mm -hmm. And I would always prefer to buy legitimate copies, but I've absolutely pirated games and played them with translation patches. Uh, Every once in a while with a smaller indie Japanese game, the developer will work directly with a translation group. And uh, for example, Yumeniko Ninaku Nori Ni Kai. And there's two. Yumeniko Nonaku Kori Ni and Yumeniko Ninaku Kori Ni Kai. Okay. (laughs) But those games, there were eight of them. The first one is free and the other seven are paid games. And I bought all of them on an English website. I was able to legally buy the game in Japanese and then download the translation patch from the same site I bought it from and then apply it according to their instructions. Mm. And so they made it really easy to get a legitimate copy of the game and patch it. It's not a situation like Mother 3 Mm -hmm. where... Even if you get a legitimate copy, the only real way to attach a translation patch is to pirate the game and run it in an emulator. I guess you could say with sort of the decline in demos in gaming today, you could kind of look at a pirated game as a demo. I think demos have increased, actually. You know, especially in the console scene, you can get an hour-long demo Mm -hmm. of, like, a ton of games. Mm -hmm. I feel like some situations that have cropped up in the past several years kind of give lie to that as a cultural thing. Uh, Game Dev Tycoon, a game by Greenheart Studios, 
Greenheart uh, Games. Greenheart Games. Uh, re- released their game, a pirated copy or a uh, hacked copy or whatever. This of was their in game. 2013. In 2013. So not recently. And the point of the game is to just, you know, build a game studio, a video game studio, and get popular and make more games. Yeah, it's a tycoon game. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the uh, hacked version they released on piracy sites, uh, at one point, your game would start getting pirated. And eventually, it got to where you would wind up shutting down because your game was pirated too much and you couldn't make money. And people were pissed. And I'm like, are you going to complain you can't play to completion? Fuck you. You're complaining that your your VR customers are stealing your game? Yeah, right. <laughs> but there were actually people on the game forum asking, well, can you, can you develop some kind of DRM in this game? So, like, shit like that makes me go, no. Culturally, you, we are not mostly pirating games just to try things out, because otherwise, nobody would have bitched about that. In the case of Game Dev Tycoon, that was actually marketing for their game, the piracy protection, and so every site covered it because it was really clever and funny. The game sold really well after that. They sold at least 10,000 copies, I think, in the week after that hit sites, they said. Mm -hmm. And I bought it. It's a great game. It's Mm -hmm. super fun. Mm -hmm. So it was a really clever marketing trick, and I liked it a lot. Hmm. And there are other games, modern games, that have similar things. Uh, Mirror's Edge, uh, in a pirated copy, there's a jump that you have to make that you just end up slowing down and you die every time. And the, the fact that people respond to this with such outrage makes me go, okay, so what's actually happening here is there's a lot of people who want a free game, and they're not just playing it to try it, because otherwise, okay, you tried it, and you can't complete it because, you know, it's a pirated game, mm-hmm. but you tried it, so now you know. Uh, but it, if that was the case, it would, there wouldn't be so much outrage, but there always is. Mm-hmm. So something else must be happening here. What is it, guys? Mm-hmm. Are you just a bunch of assholes? I don't think the demo argument really holds weight anymore now that you can easily get refunds on Steam and GOG if you have a problem with the game. Yeah. Because you can play on Steam, it's for two hours within two weeks of buying it, and I think the requirements for a refund are even more lax on GOG. Mm-hmm. And so you don't need to pirate a game to demo it. I give a little leeway for the refund thing because you have to have the money available right then in order to buy it. But yeah, like that's another reason well, you're why. Not Oh, you game. If you can't even buy it, then why are you? Well, and right. Need to demo a game? No, and you're not wrong. Like that's and that that is true. You know, well, so why, it's a thing. Why do you need the full game to demo it? I guess you know, yeah. if you're gonna pirate it for a demo. Traditionally, you'd get you know the first level, two, maybe three. Right. Um, but you wouldn't have the whole game. <laughs> right. You know, that's one hell of a demo. Right. So what about um, streamers and let's players that are profiting off of piracy? Yeah, in the case of The Witness, Jonathan Blow pointed out that there's a streamer with uh, 3 million followers who's playing a pirated version of his game. And I'm presuming that, you know, they released a version where you could tell that it was being pirated with mm-hmm. something subtle, subtly mm-hmm. different. Nothing major. I think uh, there was major piracy protection in the braid, but he said he did in, in the braid. In braid, but yeah. he said he didn't have time to do that for The Witness. Mm-hmm. But well, I, what a lot of developers were doing was releasing a fake version of their own game and then uploading it to torrent sites. Mm-hmm. So when people tried to download it, they would download the fake version. Mm-hmm. But Jonathan Blow said he didn't have time to do that with The Witness, but yeah. he did that with Braid. Mm-hmm. But uh, he said that with The Witness, you could see somebody was running a party version of the game and they were actually making money off his game and not paying him for it. And like yeah. that's just such an incredibly... That's that's like two for me. Oh, just big to you. Yeah. From what I've heard devs say, especially in response to that and just in general, like that's not uncommon. They'll look on at YouTubers or streamers and see that they're running pirated versions of their game and mm-hmm. literally turning a profit off it without paying them at all. And that that's has to be nefarious. incredibly I can't even imagine like being okay with doing that. Yeah. There, there is no justification for making a profit off no. of a pirated game. Dude, there, I mean, yeah. there is, there is some tiny justification for pirating a game in the first place. But if you're going to make a profit off of it, fucking buy the game, you asshole. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, there are even like smaller, more independent channels on YouTube and, and journalists out there that have to 
buy games to review them. And then you can get a tax write-off or something. But, I mean, it's like they're at least putting forth the effort to support these people in some way or the other. Yeah, I mean, when I used to do some freelance game journalism, I would absolutely buy stuff because I thought, I mean, like, I paid $20 for Gone Home, but I probably made at least $100 off of Gone Home, mm-hmm. so, and I think I made hundreds of dollars off of Pokemon X and Y. I made hundreds and hundreds of dollars off of Minecraft, So I, mean, I was writing about it mm-hmm. so much. So, you know, if you know you can make money off something, you're taking a gamble, like, mm-hmm. I have to pay this money up front, but I can do all these things that'll make me money in the long run and absolutely anybody who pirates a game and does it that way knows that you can do those calculations and estimate about how profitable this might be for you i paid my utilities for three months off of skyrim (laughs) um so you know you even run into instances with pirates using support forums or reaching out to developers directly asking for help yeah with piracy i mean yeah, and no, and these, some of these people will get, like with Skullgirls, they had a, oh, I can't remember what the piracy protection was in Skullgirls anymore, but they had some issue that was caused by the pirated version of the game, and people were like tweeting the devs, harassing them to fix that, and when they were like, well, buy the game, they would get just furious that people don't, they, they don't even want to just, it's not even a case of making money off of a pirated game, it's that they expect devs to give their time Mm -hmm. to help them play a pirated version of their game, and then they'll be like, well, CD Projekt Red helps pirates. Like, oh, it doesn't matter because you're not a customer, so nobody needs to hear you. And I get why CD Projekt Red does it, but nobody is obligated to ever help pirates. I don't even necessarily think anybody should. I actually uh, did pirate uh, Age of Empires 3. It's still probably in my top ten favorite games of all time. Mm-hmm. I loved the crap out of that game. When they did Age of Empires Online, the like free to play version, I ended up just like spending ridiculous amounts of money on it just because I felt so bad. I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was like well, you know, I played Age of Empires three for like three hundred hours for free, and I may as well actually give some money. And I don't even like, I don't even know if it, it was the same developer or anything, <laughs> but I, I... Well, they had already closed doors because they were bankrupt um, um, from all the piracy of the third one, so it was a different development <laughs> team, but... <laughs> Yeah. Good try, good try. <laughs> and that game wasn't even good. Like, Age of Empires Online wasn't very good. I was, like, buying stuff for my friends and stuff, too. <laughs> I knew my friends who played it. I was like, oh, I'll buy you the, the new Civilization packs and things. Mm-hmm. And I I spent a lot of money on that game, and I, I felt like I had to. Mm-hmm. And I didn't even play it much. I probably put maybe five hours into it. <laughs> Most of the stuff I pirated is just stuff. Like, I used to pirate The Sims all the time because you had to switch discs every time for expansion. So I'd use the discs to install the game and then get the pirated version so I didn't have to bother with that anymore Mm because I just wanted to hide my discs in a closet and not have to keep them out Mm -hmm. depending on which expansion I wanted to run. It was such a big pain. And I I have, you know, played a lot of Japanese games with translation patches. When those games are released here, I always buy them. And in the case of Danganronpa 2, it actually got announced for US release while I was playing it. So I stopped in Chapter 3 and waited like a year and a half to finish that game <laughs> till I could buy it because I just was like, oh, this is this is really a crappy thing to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> the only games that I have, like I have pirated as opposed to a friend put it on my computer when they repaired it, are have been like NES, SNES, and, and Game Boy games, you know, and you just download ROMs and emulators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to say that I went out of my way to buy copies of those games after I played them, but that's mostly because by the time I started doing that, the PS1 was already out, uh, the Super Nintendo was not really being developed for, and you know, nobody's going to make money off of it if I you know, try to track down some Super Nintendo cart, or the the, the developer they're going to make money off of it. The scalpers are. The, the scalpers are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, like, I, I kind of feel like it's it's a wash at, at this point. Um, but... You know, I it was it's still pirating. Mm-hmm. I pirated the PC version of Minecraft to get a screenshot and then uninstalled it because <laughs> I didn't have Minecraft. I didn't have a PS4 then. I didn't have an easy way to get a screenshot. 
So I pirated Minecraft for two minutes and got one screenshot and deleted it. Wow. <laughs> it's a really good screenshot. Wow. <laughs> but did you make money off of the screenshot? <laughs> no, I, yeah. I did not make money off of the screenshot. But I mean, I've, I, I've bought at least two copies of Minecraft, mm -hmm. so I don't feel particularly guilty about it. Mm -hmm. If I had had a PS4, they, that's where the problem really comes in, because mm -hmm. everybody needs to own a PS4, and piracy would be solved. Yeah, I am guilty of nothing, which brings us to the end of another episode. <laughs> <laughs> and there you go, folks. If you've been wondering why this entire episode has been in Spanish, that's because that was our piracy protection, <laughs> and you're listening to a fraudulent copy. <laughs> it's free, for God's sakes. Ay, caramba. <laughs> <laughs> but with that, you know, if it, piracy is your thing, look, you know, do what you got to do, I guess. I don't know, man. I mean, I barely make enough money to afford all my Jaguars and uh, Rolls Royces, but I do. Okay, and so I pay for my goddamn games. Ben Affleck, if you're listening, I'm sorry, man. All those years, I just didn't know, bro. I just didn't know. <laughs> and, and all those envelopes stuffed with pennies that you keep getting in your mailbox, that's from me, Holmes. I'm trying to repay you for all the priceless, untold number of hours of top-shelf entertainment. And how do you like them apples? <laughs> Boom! <laughs> Oh, that was Matt Damon. Half West Gaming, out! We, we did pirate some other stuff, though. I'm not happy about that. You can find our uh, half glass gaming line of bourbon. That's pirated. But all proceeds go to us, so I guess we win on that one. The piracy mm -hmm. proceeds? Mm -hmm. or just The booty. We get the booty, <laughs> basically, is what it comes down to.